Good evening, everybody. Welcome into the Nittany Lions Sports Report. It's live here on Bob Long Sports. This and every Tuesday evening at 7.30 p.m. Alongside me, Tyler Gellhouse, coming off a of bye week. So Penn State 3-0 and through the first portion of the season, through the non-conference portion of the season, and into a nine-game Big Ten gauntlet. A lot to get to here tonight. We'll briefly break down the pit game. We're going to preview Maryland, a game that is their Super Bowl. So from one Super Bowl to another, Pitt to Maryland, shutting down campus on Friday night. It will be Friday night lights in College Park, Maryland. Should be a, a lot of fun. I look forward to this football game every year. Not one that Penn State has had issues with, 104-6 to combined score in the last two years of this football game. But this, a little bit different. Mike Loxley coming in guy James Franklin knows very well and is starting to re-engage in the recruiting game and trying to win the DMV, D.C., Maryland, Virginia area. This, more than just Big Ten standings at play, bragging rights, long-term recruiting implications, and I think this is why it's going to be such a fun game. Of course, the venue and the evening as well should all add to that. Yeah, I think it's going to be a very interesting game. The last two games weren't very competitive um, it seems like the most competitive game recently was the year Maryland decided not to shake hands at the 50-yard line um, at home against uh, at Beaver Stadium against Maryland. Um, you know, these are two teams that um, really Maryland started off about as hot as anybody in the country, winning uh, against Howard 79 nothing, and then blowing out Syracuse at home. Uh, they were rolling. Um, you know, everyone they were <laughs> they were already circling um, the Penn State game and, and forgot they played Temple before that before the bye week that they had as well. Um, and Temple Temple played them well, and Temple is a good football team, um, but Temple beat them, and uh, you know Maryland was probably looking ahead a little bit, and um, so both teams come in kind of in interesting phases. Penn State three and zero didn't look their best in the first half against Buffalo, didn't look their best against Pitt. So two teams coming in um, to start conference play Friday night should be a great atmosphere. Um, expect a lot of Penn State fans, uh, obviously a lot of Maryland fans as well. It should be a lot of fun. Looking forward to it. I'm certainly looking forward to it as well. And I'm looking forward to the rest of this show as well because we're going to have some cool things coming up. A whiteboard segment, our Blitz, our weekly Blitz segment. We're going to break down Sean Clifford's vision from the pocket and certainly when he has to scramble out of the pocket and, and why that full complement of receivers – uh, may not necessarily be targeted uh, in any one particular play. And I'm going to tell you why Justin Shorter is getting the short end of the stick from a targets and a receptions perspective. So a lot of that coming up. Rob Stott is a LaSalle College High School color commentator for the football team. He does that with me on Bob Long Sports. And LaSalle takes on St. Joseph's Prep, number three LaSalle versus number one St. Joseph's Prep. Those rankings are in the state of Pennsylvania. That is this weekend at 7 o'clock. So we're going to tell his story, how he got into doing the things that he does with Bob Long Sports, but also has a really interesting role in media. And as we do every week, guest picks, but also that guest is going to be able to tell their story. A little bit of human interest side here on the Nittany Lions Sports Report. So I'm looking forward to that. One real quick thing to hit, just to put on folks' radars if they don't know or haven't heard, Penn State – has agreed to be one of four college football teams to be featured on college, uh, what, 24 7 college football on HBO, an HBO special where they're going to break down hard knock style a full week of preparation leading into a conference tilt. And for Penn State, it's going to be the week of October the 5th or leading into that homecoming game on October the 5th against Purdue, airing that following Wednesday, October 9th at 10 p.m. Set your DVRs. This is going to be fun. I mean, not just James Franklin and Penn State, but I'm watching for Mike Leach in Washington State. I'm watching for Herm Edwards in mm -hmm. Arizona yeah. State. And I don't know enough about Dan Mullen, but I'm sure that that will be entertaining as well. A look inside four of the game's biggest programs and, and walking through the day-to-day -day life of students. That should be a lot of fun. It, it, it really should be a lot of fun. Dan Mullen, by the way, I must throw this out there, uh, Ursinus graduate. I'm not sure of the year, but my Go brother Bears. my brother plays football there. So, um, but, but for Penn State, for Penn State's perspective, first let's say, <clears throat> excuse me, if Joe Paterno was a coach, this would not be happening. Um, but this is uh, obviously we're long removed from that. This is James Franklin. He loves the cameras. Um, this is a great way to promote the team. Um, it's it's just great publicity. I mean, 
Recruits are going to be dialed into this. There's no better way to to show off what you have um, behind the scenes to not only your fans and, and your university, but to the country, to recruits. Um, it's going to be very fun to watch. Obviously, looking forward to the Penn State segment, but you know I'm going to watch all four, and it's going to be very very exciting to watch, and I'm really looking forward to it. Yeah, I'm certainly looking forward to it as well. That's October the 9th. 10 o'clock p.m. is when it'll be released. That's when on Penn H- State's. Uh, oh. They're. I actually think there's – well, maybe it is Penn State. I don't know. I thought it was all four. Are they doing blended, it all like but, blended? Okay. I didn't but know. I don't know. That, yeah. that very well I don't know enough wrong. about it either yet, but yep. it sounds really cool, so but tune into yes, that. Keep that on the docket. Uh, do you want to talk about Pitt? I think it's worthwhile yeah. to talk a little bit, and then we'll get into kind of the meat of it, where we are through non-conference play leading into Big Ten conference play. Um, takeaways from Pitt um, – Obviously, everyone's going to remember the fourth down and goal that Pat Narduzzi did not go for. Instead, elected to kick a field goal down, excuse me, by seven, hitting off the upright. Um, no good. Penn State takes over. Had trouble closing out the game. Pitt had another chance. Um, you know, my takeaways from the game, though, I, I think Penn State's still lacking an identity. I, on offense, I still don't think we know what their identity is. On defense, we know that they, they they are very good against the run. The pass, people people are throwing on them right now, but the screen passes, are, they can't stop the screen passes. Um, you know, Pitt receivers made some incredible plays down the stretch to make that ball game even closer. Um, but at the end of the day, they need to find their identity, um, especially at running back. Somebody's got to step up. I, I like that, you know, Noah Kane and Journey Brown got the majority of touches in that game, but Stay consistent. I think that it's important to stay consistent. Noah Kane led him on a touchdown drive. I don't think he got back in the game after that. Just some things that didn't really make sense. Um, overall, they, they played okay, but not great. And that game easily could have been lost, too. It could have. And I want to harp in on the running back discussion because Noah Kane, seven touches on a 75 yard drive, and they score the touchdown, and he scores the touchdown on a play where he brilliantly reads the gap and is able to hit it. By the way, C.J. Thorpe, who didn't get a ton of time, a great kick-out block yeah. to, to spring him there, as well as Mennett um, driving the defensive mm-hmm. tackle downfield. But I'm not the one that said, we're going to ride the hot hand. You're not the one that said, we're going to ride the hot hand. James Franklin said, we're going to ride the hot hand, and that's how we're going to get through this four running back system you had the hot hand in the clearest of fashions, and he doesn't get back in the football game. Maybe not the most uh, important thing in the world. You did win the football right. game, but it just is mystifying because, again, it's not us that said that was going to happen. That was directly from the mouth of the coach, and he doesn't get back in the football game. Yeah, and, and going off still the offense, I think that some of the play calls are still had me scratching my head. I mean, Clifford dropped back on almost every first down in the game. Um, you know, throw his deep ball was off. I mean, his accuracy was just a tad off. He was overthrowing his receivers. Um, he got hit a bunch of times too, and that's going to happen when you're predictable play calling, dropping back almost every first down. Um, it, it just became a little predictable, and and you know, I I was disappointed. I thought they should have targeted Fryermuth a little bit more. I think he had two targets. Um, the one was picked off, but it was pass interference on the defense. It was intended for Fryermuth. They got to find ways to get KJ the ball more. Uh. James Franklin actually talked about that at his press conference. I think he has uh, 10 receptions and one rush through three games. I mean, he's had some big plays, mm-hmm. but he needs to be getting the ball like 10 times a game touches. I mean, he, he's a difference maker. I'm with you on all that. The thing I struggle with there, and we're going to get into this on the Blitz, you can't get Fryermuth the ball as much as you want him to and KJ to get the ball as much as you'd like him to. And then we're talking about Justin Shorter not getting enough touches. And, of course, Dotson's a tremendous route runner and a good sticks mover. You're not going to get all those guys the requisite touches if you're only completing, you know, 15 to 20 passes a football game. Right. Well, and it's just not possible. And now we're talking about how we're going to get four running backs there, involved There's other well. ways to get Hamler the ball, though. There's, um, that's true. You know, you know, a, a screen pass, jet sweep. Uh, the the fact is, when he gets like he had that catch in, against Pitt, and he it was like a seven yard catch, but he took unbelievable. Off. So you got he's the best athlete on the field. I mean, you have to get him the ball, and, and that's why they have him returning kicks and punts. I mean, yep. and that's smart. Yeah, he's putting him, you know injury risk, but he can score at any given time or, right. or change the field. The field. So 
Um, they just have to continue. And, and you're right. I mean, I'd like to see Shorter get the ball more. I'd really like to see everybody get the ball more. Um, but Hamler specifically is a game changer, and he can he can score at any given time he touches the ball. Absolutely. So, and I, I'm only reining this in because I've heard it a lot, and I agree with it a lot. You do need to get these playmakers the ball. I think it starts more – from protecting the quarterback and then the quarterback having better footwork in the pocket and then delivering that football to the guys in spots where they're able to succeed. But let's take that constraint. I'm sorry. Let's add that constraint back into it. Uh, what is your order? Who, who do you want to get involved most, more than they are currently, and why? I would say I would say Fryer, Muth, and Hamler. I think they're the two top targets. I think they're the two most consistent. I always forget about Jahan Dotson because he's incredibly consistent and he's kind of like, he reminds me of years ago of like a Dion Butler, kind of somebody that you overlook, not the flashiest of guys, but literally makes every catch thrown his way. Um, yeah, it's it's tough. I mean, you have four running backs who could easily really start on this team. Mm -hmm. um, you have you have really good receiving core of Hamler, Shorter, and, and Dotson. And then behind that, I think Daniel George is a little bit banged up right now. Hip and Hammer hasn't really played well. Um, Weston Carr hasn't played much, and the same goes for Sullivan Brown and Shazana. Um, so I think, you, you know, you're looking at your three starting receivers and, and really Fryermuth. I mean, those guys are mismatched nightmares across the field. And then, um, you know, the, the running backs, I guess they're going to keep going running back by committee for the most part. For the most part, Journey Brown did actually earn the number one spot, no longer an or by his name on the depth chart, and then the other three listed yeah. as ors it, in the order of Ricky Slade, Noah Kane, and then Devin and, Ford. And don't look into that too much either, as I know you won't, but that doesn't mean Ricky Slade's the first one in after Journey Brown. That's right. Um, you know... Honestly, I, I wouldn't even look too right, much into the fact that Journey, Journey Brown right. doesn't have I, an oar. I think Journey <laughs> Brown, could change. he's played well to deserve the right to be the starter. Um, for Saturday. For, for, for Friday, Friday, right. Friday, but, as it were. But, I mean, it, it's the kind of thing that, like, each each one of these backs brings something different. So, you know, Ricky Slade's a great receiver out of the backfield. Excuse me. So, you really got to play, you know, not only to the opponent, but to your game plan a lot of it. Like, you might see a lot of... Ricky Slade this week and then not a lot next week or right. Noah Kane and so on. So I think they have a good problem on their hands, but I also think it's inter it's going to be interesting to, to follow, not only for this year but coming up because who would have thought that Ricky Slade has, what, 20-some uh, yards rushing on the season through three games? Yep. And then you have yep. somebody like Devin Ford who has triple that on one run this year. So it's just an interesting thing to follow, especially with a younger group and not to mention two more um, – top running backs coming in next year. So it's going to be interesting to see how it plays out. Very much so. Other interesting notes from the depth chart this week to keep in mind. Will Fries. Will Fries got every single snap, all 63 of them, last week at the right tackle spot. Des Holmes got eight snaps. Rasheed Walker, the other 55 at left tackle. Will Fries also was co-offensive MVP with Jeremy yes. Brown, voted by the coaches this week. Yep. So it's just... It's just intriguing because we can't come on here and make these definitive statements because things change. A couple of weeks ago, we had a blitz segment where we were talking about Des Holmes and his versatility and whether Rasheed Walker would be comfortable enough playing the right tackle. Would that open up more opportunities for Des Holmes and kind of wedge Will right. Fries out? Now we're talking about Rasheed Walker, Will Fries, left and right. We're talking about the guards becoming a little bit more – expected perhaps, but Steven Gonzalez still listed as an or. He got every snap of the football game, all 63. And Mike Miranda got 42 snaps at the right guard position. And so the guards are coming into vogue a little bit. And of course, men it up the middle. This is, I think, what we're talking about and what we've been wanting to see, almost regardless of who it is on the offensive line. You want some continuity. You want five guys on there that understand how to work, not just independently, but in a link chain system. Mm -hmm. And perhaps that's the starting line, is Walker at left tackle, Gonzalez at left guard, Menett at center, and then Mike Miranda or C.J. Thorpe. I mean, I'll both see... Both those guys do things well. I mean, they're both very good. I mean, you too. almost would rather, in a funny way, want one to be the left guard and one to be the other guard, because I think they're Can actually both better than Gonzalez. I, 
I mean, Adam Gonzalez Payne. has kind of like leveled off and has kind of stayed the same recently. Right. Uh, I think he's overall a good player. He might have a shot at the next next level to make a team in the NFL. Um, but these two guys, Thorpe and Miranda, who are redshirt sophomores, definitely have a lot more potential. So that'd be something else that's interesting to, to monitor as the season goes along. But I yeah. do know, talking about the tackles, that James Franklin is very pleased with um, Rasheed Walker. He mentioned on his uh, press conference today, they said, well, we're not really hearing a lot about him. Well, that's a good thing, usually, if you're not hearing about your left tackle or any lineman because that means they're not getting penalties and they're not getting beat, so you're not really hearing his name too much on TV. So something that looks like the tackles are starting to really uh, take care of business. And and also, um, you know, it's good if, if, it not, if one of them go down, you have somebody like Des Holmes that – seems that they can do the job to to fill in yep yep uh interesting point you made there on the guards and steven gonzalez w would you though he's a senior and has more experience do you want those two other guys in there and i know we're jumping around a little bit but did you happen to see or hear any of adam brenneman's podcast that he recently did this week was with tommy stevens i did not hear it no Tommy Stevens came onto the podcast, and Adams had great interviews. He had Christian Hackenberg to break down the exodus of Bill O'Brien and, and how that entire situation went down leading into and then post-sanctions. Really a th enthralling listen, and uh, you know we don't always recommend opposing, not opposing, but other Penn State podcasts. Adam Brennan's podcast doesn't necessarily count as that, but he does talk a lot about Penn State. Those are a lot of his connections. Highly recommend both of those podcasts. But Tommy Stevens came on there and for the first time really addressed all out his decision to transfer. And he said, listen, I was never afraid of the competition. I always wanted to go in there and win that starting job. But that he himself felt and didn't say that necessarily that the coaching staff uh, – through this onto him or, or led him to believe this, but that there was a thought that, hey, if I play in spring ball and, and into the summer practices and I get to a point where it's either or, myself or Sean Clifford, what's the best thing for Penn State? It might not be the best thing for Tommy Stevens, but the best thing for Penn State, all else equal, might be to get the guy out there who has three years of eligibility left. Right. And so that was the big part of the reason that he transferred, uh, why he decided to go into another quarterback battle. I mean, beggars well, can't be cheersers, but he knew, knew Moorhead well. Mississippi State perhaps had a better chance to win that job, and he did. But again, uh, we're only scratching the surface. Yeah. Highly recommend folks it, listen to interesting, that. Interesting, but going off that, Tommy Stevens actually isn't starting right now for yeah. them. They have a freshman, Garrett Schrader. Um, Who, Stevens, I what? think he was backed up, uh, banged up a little bit, excuse me. And I think uh, last week against Kansas State got pulled. It may have been two weeks ago, I'm sorry. But um, he hasn't looked that great since yeah. he got banged up. And I don't know if he got pulled because he got banged up or – because he wasn't playing well, he wasn't performing well, and they put this true freshman, Garrett Schrader, who has got SEC Freshman of the Week or something yeah. like that. Although so, if I mean, Schrader keeps lifting himself and doing 360. Yeah, he might not be playing hits, long either. Yeah. Stevens has got to stay ready. So something interesting to, to follow, of course, for Penn State fans. Yep. Um, in terms of other depth chart items of note leading out of the bye week, it's always interesting. You have another week of practice, things do get determined over the course of that time frame. They work you hard over that time frame. Uh, Brandon Smith moves up to second team strong side linebacker. And Micah Parsons specifically mentioned that Brandon Smith's versatility is going to serve him well. It allows Micah Parsons to move uh, from Will to Sam or from Sam to Will. And, and it's not as if Brandon Smith is only comfortable at one spot. And so that's good. You're not pulling Mike off so, the field. You can pull Cam Brown from time to time to give him a blow. And Brandon Smith, who was previously listed as a weak side. Will, right? Will. Behind Lucetta and P Parsons Lucetta. Yep. And now you're looking at a guy that can play either strong side or weak side. And that, I think, gives Penn State a lot more flexibility. A guy that has shown up on campus ready to play at this he level. Lo he looks ready to play, too, and he can hit. More so than Lance Dixon, I would say. Yeah, at this point, yes. Um, and I, I believe they also move Lance Dixon over to the opposite side That's now. That's right. So yep. backing up Cam Brown is Brandon Smith right now. And then I guess behind him would be Catcher, Charlie Catcher. And then yep. in the middle you're going Jan Johnson, Ellis Brooks, Lucetta, the number three in the middle. And then the will is Parsons, Lucetta, two, Dixon, three. Yep. Okay. That's right. 
That's so right. we talked about it the one time, the difference between Sam and Will and Mike. So essentially, do you think that this is a good move to move um, Smith to the Sam? I do. Yeah, I, I, I'll say this. I think he's good enough to play either for some of the same reasons that we talked about in the past. You know, one of those positions is you're going to need to drop into coverage. Strong side, you're going to line up on the same side as the tight end. And depending upon the coverage, whether it's zone or man, you're going to be asked to pick up some coverages. And so Brandon Smith comes in with that size, speed, versatility. He can yeah. do that. Uh, he can also, you know, stuff the run. But again, we saw some of the bigger hits he's laid be in the secondary-ish, in, right. in coverage. Mm -hmm. um, and I think he has the athleticism to do that. But again, he can also rush the passer right. as uh, good as anybody. What I think is interesting about it, too, is he's a pretty similar build uh, to Cam Brown. You know, lanky, 6'4", six, 6'5", yep. six, um, type linebackers. And, and I would say that he's much further along right now than Lance Dixon is. I still expect Lance Dixon to be a heck, heck of a football player at Penn State. Um, but the linebacker room is full, and it's in good hands right now. Yes. Uh, and, you know, everybody's pretty much um, outside of Cam Brown and Jane Johnson, underclassmen, so the future is bright there as well. The future is absolutely bright. Trent Gordon moves up to second team cornerback and Donovan Johnson back to third. Uh, Johnson was, was the receiver on, uh, was it Tasir Mack that went up and got one? Yeah, and he also line. was against Buffalo in one of the longer passes, but – um, the coverage actually on both of those wasn't terrible. No, it wasn't. I, I, it was actually I think he good. got banged up. I can't remember if it was Buffalo or Pitt, but he did get banged up a little bit. I'm not sure if that's why he, he dropped off to, to three. Mm -hmm. I still expect him to play a lot of football, so not really something um, to be too concerned about if you're Donovan Johnson, not that he's listening to the show, or if you're thinking, oh, he's not that you know good anymore. I think he'll still see the field. Right. And then the last thing I have, and I'll, I'll then defer to you, is how – tight the wide receiver room is getting from a snaps perspective. Uh, just about any time you have three wide receivers on the field, a running back in the backfield, and a tight end on the line, which is a set that they'll go with quite often, it's most likely going to be shorter at the, um, at the X position, solo on that side of the field. Jahan Dotson at the Z, accompanied by K.J. Hamler in the slot. And Dan Chisena had... Nearly a spectacular catch. He, and by the way, going off of Chisena, I, that was an unbelievable special teams coverage. I, I don't, on that punt, I don't think that was a penalty. Sure. Um, I don't know what you think, but he literally timed that perfectly. Yep. Um, you don't have to give the guy two yards anymore like you used to. Um, you know, the guy literally called it simultaneously, blasted him, fumble. I mean, that would have changed the game right there, would too. Have. No doubt um, about that. You know, I think that the, the referee was kind of questionable that game, um, but... Nevertheless, I mean, Jacena almost made like almost like catch of the year type of thing. Yep. And he played a really good game. So I expect to keep seeing him a little bit out there. The only thing I'll say to that is Daniel George was injured. He was injured. And when right. he comes back, I think he moves right ahead. But we'll see. Right. It, it's in. It, I'm, I'm still kind of shocked we haven't seen more of Weston Carr. Yeah. And Hip, Hippenhammer's had his chances and just hasn't taking advantage of the chances that he's had out yeah. there. So um, Cam you know. Sullivan Brown had a nice catch in eight in eight mm -hmm. snaps. Well, yeah. uh, Hip and Hammer with seven so snaps. Chisena eleven. But again, that's right. That's it. So twenty six snaps total by receivers not named Shore Dotson or. But those Hamler. three that you just mentioned, the starters. I mean, they are they are much better than the guys behind them. And then I would put George as like the next guy in type of thing. Yep, when I, healthy. When I healthy. agree with that. Yeah. So. That's kind of my, my thoughts on where we stand depth chart-wise. We're not making any statements here because that's subject to change and most likely will change next week. But uh, intriguing there to see how things have changed over the course of the year thus far. Maryland, this Friday night on Fox Sports 1, two-headed monster on offense. Josh Jackson at quarterback. Virginia Tech transfer. There you go. <laughs> he and Jordan Stout. That's yeah, it. By the way, yes, we sir. didn't even mention Jordan Stout in our pit. Recap, Amazing. what an unbelievable weapon. Um, you know, in the, today's college football world of the transfers, uh, if you don't know this, he was at Virginia Tech, transferred because they didn't have a scholarship for him. All he's done for Penn State is hit two, maybybe three. He hasn't missed a kick. 50-plus uh, yarder, field goals, two. Um, two at least. And yeah. then uh, he's a 50-plus kicker, 50 yards and plus, and then um, hasn't given up a return. Um, everything's been touched back yeah. for kickoffs. And that's a that's a unbelievable weapon that you won't find on 
you know, you look at the transfer world in these days and who gets who's going where, and he's not popping up on many people's radars, but an unbelievable get for Penn State. Unbelievable get for Penn State. And he's only a sophomore. That. Yep, yep. Anthony McFarland, the other guy I want to talk about for Maryland, though, running back, a guy who scored three times in the big win against Syracuse and even in the loss to Temple, ran for 140 yards. Josh Jackson can do a little bit of everything, and a guy that did ab- was able to get some snaps under his belt at Virginia Tech and obviously work with a high-level program. He comes to Maryland now, and they do have it going on decently well offensively. He really struggled, though, against Temple, and the wheels kind of came to a halt yeah. for this Maryland team against Temple after putting up 79 points in their first game after, what was it, 52 against Syracuse, and that game wasn't even close. And I don't think Syracuse is as good as people had thought they were. Um you know, they got smoked by Maryland and then obviously creamed by Clemson. But they were ranked in the 20s when yep. Maryland beat them. But I don't think that they were as good as a lot of people had thought they were going to be. Fair enough. Uh, very small Still very sam- impressive, though, for Maryland. Right, and very small sample size. So this may mean nothing because you throw out that first game. But the first two games were at home. Super impressive. Next game, Lincoln Financial Field. Not so impressive. This one heading back to College Park. Josh Jackson, Anthony McFarland, I think the key, clearly, for Penn State – the run defense against Pitt was spectacular, just 24 rushing yards allowed. Uh, what I am concerned about, though, and I think everybody listening to this show is concerned about, is Penn State pins the ear back. I, I would say Shaka Tony had a tremendous football game defensively. He but, did. But there are times where I felt like there was a disjoint between the defensive tackles and the defensive ends. So Shaka Tony is coming with his, you know, like he's coming with his ears cut off and he's just absolutely, or ears pinned back. That's a, t- <laughs> that's a bad uh, pun there or whatever that is. But like ears pinned back, let him go. He's heading at the quarterback, right? At that point, if you're Antonio Shelton, you need to keep some level of gap control mm-hmm. rather than just, again, dialing up the quarterback because Pickett he did one of two things. He stepped up to the front of the pocket almost with impunity. Yeah, as the defensive right. tackles got out of position or simply dumped off on a screen and let the blockers develop downfield. Those were the two biggest issues with the Penn State defense in that pit game and allowed Kenny Pickett uh, to have a career day. The reason there, Tyler, is because there's no gap control and the defensive tackles are getting too far right. into the backfield. Well, I mean, and that's interesting you say that too because Penn State was getting pressure on Pickett. They just couldn't get home. I mean, they were, they were close to him multiple yes. times. Even Parsons was close to him, played a heck of a game, Parsons did. Um, and and it's funny you say that with the defensive tackles getting up too far. I mean, that's why Pitt was dialing in on those screen plays third and long, and they were converting because the defensive tackles wanted to get to the quarterback, and that's not always their, their role. Right. And, you know, Pitt saw that. The screen the screen was wide open. No doubt in my mind, Penn State practiced against the screen a lot um, this, this bye week. Um, but – that was a very good good take, Bob, because not a lot of people realize what the defensive tackle's position is. Is It's not always to just go for the quarterback. You have a gap to control, too, right. so your ends can get there. And that's going to depend as well on whether you're playing man or zone coverage, whether you have a quarterback spy out there from the middle linebacker position. But either way, I was very impressed with Kenny Pickett and his ability not to scramble for yards, but to scramble to be able to throw the ball downfield, keeping his eyes up. Mm-hmm. and uh, And that's something that... Penn State's going to have to contend with with Josh Jackson as well. And I think Jackson's a little bit of a dual-threat quarterback. I don't think Penn State's really seen that this year. Pickett can run. He didn't run much against Penn State. Um, so just something something to watch for because in the past, Penn State has struggled a bit with the dual-threat quarterback. But uh, they've been very good against the run this year, though, so it, it should be interesting. Tyler, what else you got for our uh, main main body of the show here before we get to our whiteboard segment? And then, of course, Rob Stott, who will be here to do the guest picker segment. Yeah, I guess, um, you know, wrapping up the non-conference play, um, you know, it had it, it had its ups and its downs. Uh, Penn State has a lot to work on if they want to be, um, you know, in contention for the Big Ten Championship. I think that the East right now, I would put Ohio State one and then kind of everybody else after that. Michigan's not looking very impressive, so I'd put Penn State above them. Michigan State's always kind of eh, but they have Penn State's number. Um, so I think Penn State can make a run at it, but they're going to have to improve um, the O-line, the run game, and ultimately <laughs> I think the play calling has to improve. Um, it's just it, it seems like it's the same thing as last year a lot of times. I just think that we 
that that Ronnie has to change his ways a bit. I don't know what the answer is, but uh, it just seems too predictable at times. I mean, Pitt, Pitt knew what they were doing, and Pitt's defense was ready for it. And the other thing is big play, big strike offense, not going to matter the time of possession when you're scoring, but when you're not. That's when, right. That's when the issue well, comes. Well, because when I think when they were the 2016 team that won the Big Ten, they didn't have great time of possession. I mean, they were a quick strike team. Yep. Uh, you know, 100%. McSorley over the top to Gasicki and Blacknall, Godwin, and those guys. And then at Hamilton, and you have Barkley out of the backfield. I mean, it was a quick strike team. They hardly ever won a time of possession, but they were scoring. And that's the difference. Yep. That is exactly the difference. And you put a lot of strain on your defense when you're not. We saw it against Buffalo. We saw it against Pitt. So, um, yeah, you satisfied. I, I mean, I think the defense is up to par for a champ Big Ten championship, um, especially the run defense. I think if they can figure out the kinks in the offense a little bit, uh, special teams has been pretty good for the most part. Um, you know, they just have a young team still. And, and it's going to be interesting. These next games coming up, starting with Maryland, it, this is a big five-game stretch. And you have, to, you have to get off to a good start against Maryland because the longer you let them hang around, the more their crowd's into it and um, the tighter Penn State could play. I'll say – this as we head to break here there are a lot of small issues that they need to fix for penn state to be successful i think the most important is the guy we're going to talk about next that's the quarterback sean clifford we're going to talk about his deficiencies at this point nothing earth shattering nothing i don't think he can figure out but it is into the cauldron of college football into a shrinking pocket with less time than he had in high school. Some things that I've seen that I'll break down next here on the Nittany Lions Sports Report. Stay with us, everybody. Thanks for being here, and we'll be right back. Ford is Mayfair's neighborhood Ford store. Nobody knows your neighborhood like Dunphy Ford. Nearly 40 years. Right here on Frankfurt Avenue. Generation after generation, our neighbors continue to be our customers. We have access to the cars and trucks you want with financing you need. Dumpy Ford is Northeast Philly's first choice for America's number one brand. 7700 Frankfurt Avenue in Mayfair. Online at www.dumpyford.com. Come experience the Dumpy difference. You'll be glad you did. I chose CCM because I have found that this company um, on the level of scaling that we have here, the volume that we are doing, to truly have every department head and employee fully engaged in the mission of the company to make it an originator-focused, um, production-first uh, company. I have not found that anywhere I've worked, and I've worked at one of the largest banks in the world, down to the smallest tiny community bank and correspondent lender, no one has been able to consistently deliver that message. Welcome back inside the Nittany Lions Sports Report, everybody. It is time for the Blitz, where we take you to the whiteboard and break down one concept of Penn State football, show you how it's going to manifest itself on the field or what we've seen in prior weeks. And this week, it's about Sean Clifford. And we talked about it in the opening part of the show here, but how Clifford has been one of the we'll say the inefficiencies of the offense and how I think with a better performance from him, it's going to make the offensive line look better. And frankly, I think it's going to result in a higher margin of victory in games like we saw a week and a half ago against Pittsburgh. So I broke this down, Clifford, the quarterback here, and I def defined here four quadrants of the football field and where his eyes are. And so, you know, we'll count this area here as the general screen area. This downfield uh, to the left-hand side, this obviously downfield to his right, and this the screen side on the right. When you take a look at quarterbacks, and Trace McSorley was tremendous at this, and the ability to get from here from a vision perspective to over here from a vision perspective and back to here to get to a third what we call progression, progression one, progression two, progression three, in whatever order you might say, McSorley was very, very talented at doing that. And that's why he was able to get guys like going back to Chris Godwin and Saeed Blacknall and Mike Kosicki and all those guys involved, not to mention Barkley out of the backfield, which would be a read down here. He was so good at that, and that is going to come with time for Sean Clifford. But what I've seen from him thus far is a struggle 
with one, keeping the feet set in the pocket. And listen, there's a natural amount of movement that you have to do. Kenny Pickett, again, for Pittsburgh, did a great job of being able to slide his feet from one side of the pocket to the other. But it was footwork done with purpose. It was footwork executed properly. And it was footwork with the eyes still downfield. I hate to say happy feet, but Sean Clifford has had happy feet at times over the course of the year. And you'll see kind of sputtering those feet, weight on the heels, which is why you see some back leg throws from t- at times from Sean Clifford. And when that's the case, you're worried more about finding the nearest defender rather than the eyes downfield. It's just natural. It's not possible to be able to have poor footwork and truly go through those progressions one by one to get to your third or even your fourth option. So for a quarterback like Trace McSorley, I'd think of the field more like this. Are you going to drop it off? Or are you going to fire down the field and be able to you know, find a receiver on either side at any length, going to the end zone, wherever it might be? But Sean Clifford, to this point in the season, is I'm going to break this down into four quadrants, and I've only seen his ability to get to his second progression. So if he's looking first option here for a streaking K.J. Hamler, and Hamler's covered, and perhaps he can see the tight end going down the seam, that's read one. Read two is going to be likely over here, and this is whether it's one of the running backs or if it's uh, you know somebody running a quick out over here. That's about all he can do. This side of the field is completely open. And so the issue is that when you have Jahan Dotson, K.J. Hamler, and Justin Shorter, so Z, Slot, an X receiver, the X receiver is always on his own side of the field. So Justin Shorter, I think, has done a decent job to get himself open, whether that's a crossing route, whether that's a curl route, or if he's trying to beat his guy deep along the sideline, and it's a good time to throw a deep ball and let him go get it against a smaller cornerback. So I think he's actually done a decent job of that. But when Sean Clifford doesn't have the footwork to keep his eyes downfield, can't get to his third progression, you're siphoning off this side of the field, and that's an issue. And it's an issue for Penn State going forward as they're going to go against bigger, stronger defenses, more agile corners, but most importantly, more effective defensive linemen that are going to be getting into the backfield. And so that's what I'm seeing right now with Sean Clifford. It's not something that can't be fixed. It's something he had to deal with at the high school level, certainly, and in limited action and against scout team and whatever it might be. He's going to find a way to succeed, But it's all going to start with the footwork in the backfield, in the pocket, being able to move effectively and efficiently with sound footwork rather than happy feet, keep the eyes downfield, and now open up this entire field. Because with Shorter and Fryermuth and Hamler and Dotson and a tremendous catching running back out of the backfield and Ricky Slade, you tell me why those five targets and those five weapons shouldn't be able to contend with any defensive backfield in the Big Ten. It will. It can. They're talented enough to do it. They're highly recruited kids. They're tremendous athletes. Sean Clifford is the difference to bring that home. So that's our Blitz segment here today. Think about that as you're watching the games over the course of the next few weeks. How many progressions? Clifford, this way, this way, eyes downfield, Now check it down. Is he getting to his third or fourth progression? Or are we seeing more of, I'm trying to get the ball out quickly. I'm more worried about where the blocking's coming from and keep an eye on that footwork. Those are the keys to Sean Clifford's success. We know he can throw a great ball. But now can he find the receivers and deliver effectively to manage the football game? That's what I'm looking forward to. I appreciate everybody being with us here on this segment. We have Rob Stott coming up next in studio live to break down his picks and he's going to chase down his broadcast booth mate, Tyler Kern, who's 5-1. and one. He's in the clubhouse with the lead, so Rob has his work cut out for him. We'll learn about his story as well. Can't wait for that. We'll see you guys on the other side. This is the Nittany Lion Sports Report and this week's Blitz segment. Dunphy Ford is Mayfair's neighborhood Ford store. Nobody knows your neighborhood like Dunphy Ford. Nearly 40 years. Right here on Frankfurt Avenue. Generation after generation, our neighbors continue to be our customers. We have access to the cars and trucks you want. With financing you need. 
Dumpy Ford is Northeast Philly's first choice for America's number one brand. 7700 Frankfurt Avenue in Mayfair. Online at www.dumpyford.com. Come experience the Dumpy difference. You'll be glad you did. Welcome back, everybody. Inside the Nittany Lions Sports Report studios, Bob Long, Tyler Gellhouse, and our guest picker for the evening, Rob Stott of LaSalle College High School Broadcasting Lore, yeah. my <laughs> esteemed my esteemed color commentator in the booth for all LaSalle College High School football games. Going on year five, Rob, and perhaps the most anticipated game of our time here together coming up this Saturday night against St. Joseph's Prep. Yeah, it's going to be a good one. Uh, very much looking forward to it. Um, certainly the game of the year. I think every LaSalle player, every year, no matter the year, has that game circled on their calendar. Uh, you never look past a week, right, in football. You know, that's what you take it out every week at a time, one week at a time. But St. Joe's prep, you know, that, and coming off of a bye, too. Both of these teams coming off of a, a week of rest, uh, able to come into this game with just, I can't imagine the anticipation and how it's feeling in school right now to be walking those halls knowing that, you know, you got two weeks to prepare for prep, the biggest game of the year, and it's going to be a fun one. This is a fun segment for us here, Rob. Tyler and I like to bring in folks that have – Different background, something cool that they do in the community. We like to tell that story. And then, of course, we're going to get your picks and try to go up against, uh, again, your fellow boothmate, Tyler <laughs> Kern. Five and one. Five that's, and that's one. Yeah, he, and he started off the season, too. He did. Our, our week one. Very Everybody's impressive. Yeah. Unbelievable. Up. Unbelievable. Well, I'll, I'll see what I can do. Yes. <laughs> yes. But uh, if you could, tell your story about, you know, your background and then getting to – what you're doing now with LaSalle, but obviously that's just a piece of all the things that you do in the communication space, et yep. cetera. Yep. So um, obviously, you know, connected with you uh, through our con connection at LaSalle, uh, class of 2006 from there. Um, was a wrestler while I was there, did, you know, some of the broadcasting stuff while I was there, kind of carried that, that theme with me throughout uh, high school, college, uh, and into what I'm doing right now, uh, working in journalism uh, in the B2B media space, uh, business to business covering consumer tech. So travel to tech shows, cover all the latest, you know, announcements and uh, gadgets and that sort of thing and uh, have, having fun with that. But, um, you know, nice to be able to do that and still be in the area, have the connection to LaSalle, uh, member of the LaSalle Alumni Association Board of Directors. Uh, so, you know, got a wife that teaches at the school. So I, I am LaSalle through and through. It's kind of crazy uh, how they, they rope you back in when you get back in the area. But uh, <laughs> Donations, yeah, it, donations, <laughs> donations. <laughs> no comment, no comment, no comment. Uh, but uh, no, but I mean, and then to get, you know, not even just, you know, having the wife teach there, but then, you know, having the opportunity to connect with you and, and do the games. It's, it's just a fun spot to be in and, uh, you know, love doing it, love what I do. And uh, love having the chance to come on and try to beat Tyler Kearns in these yes. picks this week. So we'll we'll see. We'll see who has the bragging rights going into St. Joe's. So Tyler, Rob has a little bit of a nickname <laughs> on the broadcast. <laughs> and what is that? That nickname would be Riverboat Rob. It would be, wow. and uh, that would also explain why in my study for these games I went to the Vegas odds <laughs> for, for all of them. I had good. to understand the spreads and all that good stuff. I'm so. expecting six and zero here. Then <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm picking everybody who you pick. Because <laughs> I need it. <laughs> so not only is he uh, into uh, the spreads in Vegas, but from a Riverboat Rob perspective, the genesis of that name was actually because anytime I'd ask Rob, all right, interesting spot here. Is this four down territory or fourth and five from your own 45? What do you think? Never. Go for it. Never go a for question. It. Never a question. Always go for it. Well, especially in high school. <laughs> of course. You never know what's going to happen. Any play, it could be fourth and 35 from your own 10, and your you know, first down is likely in high school football <laughs> as anything. So who knows? <laughs> yeah, and who knows how far the punt goes, et cetera. If it doesn't get blocked or snapped yeah. over his head. And Although like... I'll say this. This game we're going to see you on You probably Saturday. don't see much of that. I was going to say that. Well, maybe you don't see a lot of punting between these two teams where they no. haven't had to punt much. But – the punters that they have, both teams, very, very good. This is high-level high school football. I mean, you're talking about a lot yeah. of kids, Tyler, that might be being recruited by Penn State well, or other schools in the state of Pennsylvania and beyond. Yeah, I mean, I, I know and, that, that um, McCord, the quarterback for prep, is a uh, junior committed to Ohio State right yep. now. He's one of the top in the country. Uh, Marvin Harrison, Jr., is the top receiver. It's a name that should uh, sound familiar. Yeah, um, I'm not going to explain that one. You probably <laughs> should know it. Um, probably also going to Ohio State. 
Jeremiah Trotter, junior linebacker for prep, also a junior going to Clemson. Yep. So that's what I know about prep. I'm sure there's other guys that are Division One on that team. I'm sure LaSalle has a few, but prep is, from what I know, they're very um, – I mean, they played IMG, I guess, two weeks ago. They, I yep. think they lost. They they lost. What was the score of that? 31 25. Yep. Close game, and they played it at Rutgers? Yes, Rutgers. So that was another and story. And I know, I know that there's another story about <laughs> yeah. the Catholic League didn't want them playing IMG or something like that. But well, so the they, game was originally scheduled at Widener for the right. night prior. No, the night after. It would have been a Saturday night game at Widener. And ESPN came in, to their credit, and they wanted to call the game, and they had to change the time. And I guess Widener could not accommodate. Again, that is the official story, and Rutgers could. Just so happened that that was the venue that St. Joseph the played prior, to yep. the, the week prior against St. John's, hmm. another regional, national power. And, uh, and so that game was hosted at Rutgers. It was just a shame, uh, only because I know people were going to show out for that game. Yeah. And well, especially it's tough when it's to a make smaller the, stadium, the crowds obviously looks bigger because it fills the stadium and yeah. more. So Even a Saturday night at Rutgers, but they may have had more people than Saturday. a Rutgers home game. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, Saturday night at Widener in Philly versus asking people to go up to Piscataway on a Friday right, evening right, is right, right. tough. But anyway, that is beside the point. This game this weekend is going to be great. It's going to be live on Bob Long Sports, seven o'clock p.m. Bob Long, Rob Stott, Tyler Kern on that call. But uh, I mean, what do you think, Rob? I, it's I know be, you're calling the game. Yeah, so yeah. Like, so you can't no. put your pick in, but yeah. you can give us your keys. <laughs> no. Not put, uh, not put, uh, do the, the Kirk Herbstreit thing, not right. putting my pick in. Uh, right. But, um, you know, it's going to be a tough one. Uh, I, I, I feel like, you know, we talked about it, uh, I guess, two weeks ago, a week and a half ago, um, when we were at Haverford, how it felt like during that game, the sloppy start that LaSalle got off to it likely had something to do with the fact that they might have been looking ahead. Um, you know, pre- already mentally preparing themselves for St. Joe. So you know that, you know, Coach Steinmetz has had this team ready to go for two weeks. Um, they're going up against a a tough, tough competition, tough team in St. Joe's. I mean, you mentioned the names Harrison Jr., Trotter Jr., <laughs> <the> football <laughs> lineage. It, it's there. It, it's very apparent. And, you know, the talent level, where they're getting scouted to. Um, yeah. LaSalle's not going to want to go out there and get embarrassed by this team. And I, I think that's a lot of the talk that you're hearing uh, throughout, you know, the, the areas that, yes, these teams are one in three in the, in Southeast PA, but in the um, state, in the state. And, you know, LaSalle knows that this is, this is an opportunity. There's a lot of people that are doubting them. So yeah. uh, I want to see them get up and, and get ready for this game and, and put on a good show. So Tyler, I know you're well, very involved with the high school. Yeah. Sport, I mean, sports I, I, as well. I'm, I'm sorry guys. I'm going prep by at least two touchdowns. <laughs> Based yeah. off the lineage alone, um, but I, I just know from a co- like a recruiting standpoint, I know you know three of the guys that are highly recruited on St. Joe's Prep, and they're all juniors. And to me, that's that's tough to overcome. And they have probably three top one hundred and fifty recruits that are all juniors. I don't think LaSalle has any guys up there. I mean, I'm sure they have great players, but these guys are uh, top notch Division One players. And I think that's going to be too much. From what I know, of the two teams, I think. Prep should win by about two touchdowns. Uh, <laughs> I ha- I have no no um, dog in no, the fight. I mean, but for you guys, I want LaSalle, but I, I think that Prep will probably pull it out. Well, bear in mind that we are a neutral third party when we're out calling these games. <laughs> alum, I, alum though. We are alums, yeah. and we are contracted by LaSalle to broadcast their games. And certainly, you know, it, it is good for uh, those kids. And we get to know the kids. Uh, better than we do any other school, and so sure, it's very it, cool. it is. It is good for the kids, and we're happy for the kids. And yes, it's our alma mater. However, when we are behind the mics, we are you know third party broadcasters, and we're going to call the game as we see it. Uh, so it should be a lot of fun. The one thing I'll say is Lasalle has a sophomore that looked a lot like those now Ooh. juniors that you're talking about. What's the name? Sam, Sam Brown. Brown. What position? Running, Running back. Really? Yes. Hmm. Kid already, to look out for. already power five offers. Really set a uh, set a school record in his second game this season. Uh, I believe it was with five touchdowns in a game. Oh wow! Uh, followed it up with a four touchdown performance against Haverford. The kid is you can give him the ball and it, it could be your 
you're looking at maybe a touchdown every time really? he touches it. It's unbelievable. It's six wow. one yeah. two. A, what do you think? Uh, two, two ten. Two, I was going to say two ten two twenty. Yeah. yeah, and he can run. Wow. And he's got speed, agility. I mean, he he makes one cut and. He, and this gone. game is Saturday at seven. Saturday yes. night seven. And you can catch it on Bob Long Sports. Catch it you on can. Bob Long Sports. What I will say: some inside baseball. Is there is a good chance that tickets sell out tomorrow. Wow. Little birdie told me that. <laughs> So that's gonna be that's gonna be a crazy. I'd find atmosphere. a way to get your tickets sooner rather than later if you'd like to attend that football game, number one versus number three in the state. Rob Stott, our guest picker here tonight. That's uh, his story. Anything else that that we, we should add in terms of you, your background, what you do, et cetera? You know, just what what do the folks want to know about mm. Rob Stott? What, what what's to know about me? Um, I used to run a sports blog. Uh, that was a, a fun thing I used to do in, in high school and college. Uh, had had a good time with that. Got into f- the fantasy football side of things on the professional level. Um, had a, a nice little blog and and podcast, and uh, you know got to cover the space that way. So putting the the skills to use all over the place and good. Uh, you know being able to to come in and do it with Bob Long and Bob Long Sports and on the pot, on the uh, b- the broadcasts and. Now making this guest appearance is, uh, it feels right at home. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> well, then let's get you out of your comfort zone then and right. make some picks. Who this should be fun. All right. So um, still, like we said, Tyler Kern in first place, five and one. Um, Chris went three and three. And Dan, uh, two weeks ago, we had a bye, bye week last week, went uh, four and two. Um, he probably wants us to let everybody know that he did call Arizona State to beat Michigan State because of Herm Edwards, and that was the reason why. <laughs> and, and they won. So good for him. All right. um, anyway, Bob is ten for eight on the year. Myself, I am uh, six and twelve. So I really got to turn it around here. Uh, but we do have some good games to pick this week. Uh, Rob, as always, it'll be five games head to head, followed by um, the spread for Penn State. Um, so we are going to start off with um, USC at Washington. So I'm going to start off by saying that. Uh, if there's a sport that I, you should not consider me an expert <laughs> on, it is college football. So, Bob Long, I appreciate the invite. Uh, no, but I, like I said, I did my homework. Neither was um, Tyler Curran, by the way. <laughs> so I, I did my homework and, and went to Vegas, and uh, I know we talked about, you know, obviously the last game is the one that we, we look at against the spread. But this is one that, you know, I thought was pretty interesting. You know, Washington going in is a nine-and-a-half-point home favorite. And when the Trojans are, you know, against the spread this year, three-and-eleven, uh, I'm sorry, under Clay Helton, under their head coach. 3-11 and against the spread, uh, and then 2-12 and outright when they're an underdog. So, that being said, I'm going to go with Washington at home as a 9.5-point favorite to take that win. He reminds me of the bear on college game day. Yes. <laughs> Putting the, the bear up on the – reading all these ridiculous facts, and I, that's a good pick. I mean, uh, you can go, but I'll go Washington too. Yeah, I'm going Washington, absolutely. Uh, Jacob Eason, a transfer from University of Georgia. Uh, I do like him, and there's more continuity at the Washington quarterback position than there is at the Southern Cal quarterback position. Ended up down yeah. with Fink yeah, yeah. last week yep. after Slovis went down. That's their second quarterback but, and that's going down. And they beat Utah. And they beat Utah, and they, Fink had an amazing game, and he threw up a bunch of hand grenades that ended up – being caught, right? They tremendous and, well, receivers. And, and the interesting part about this game is the Pac-12 is off to like a ridiculously weird start this year. I mean, like Utah was supposed to be the favorite. They lose to third-string quarterback at USC. UCLA's down by thirty-some points in the second half. Yep. Come back to beat Washington State. Um, everybody kind of just floats around in that division. Yes. There's not like that one team that's just going to take it. Uh, many people thought it was Utah. Some people thought it was Oregon. It still might be one of those two teams, but then you have other teams that kind of are just there and ranked, and, and slowly but surely Pac-12 has just as many ranked teams, I think, as anybody else or close to it. That's right. So it's an interesting conference. Um, but I think for, for my pick there, it's all those kids can play. Slovis right. can play. Fink can play. I think the luck runs out. And I think Jacob Eason and the continuity of the quarterback position is the difference for Washington. Isn't Washington, are they coming off of a loss to Cal? I think they they um, no, they lost to Cal in week two. But, um, yeah, so, I mean, even Washington um, was a team that still could win the Pac-12. I mean, mm-hmm. it really is wide open. Um, next game, we are going to go, this is a ranked, uh, the first game was ranked two, but 18, Virginia goes to number 10, Notre Dame, coming off of a very tough competitive loss, I may add, at Athens, 
against uh, the Georgia Bulldogs. They were, and that that's exactly where uh, you know I go for my intel on this one. Got caught a lot of that game. Uh, saw a lot of uh, Notre Dame and Georgia. Um, also, adding into the fact that Virginia is coming into this as an eleven point dog. Um, you know, it, it, Notre Dame. I mean, it seems like the safe pick, but um, I, I just like the way that they did get up for for Georgia. I felt like it was a game that was winnable for them. Um, you know, a big spot for them to come up and and you know I, I don't think anyone was giving them a chance in that one. Uh, but you know they ended up making it at least competitive. So uh, I, I like to I like them taking down Virginia. Maybe not by that eleven point margin. I don't think they cover there for anyone. You know, writing at home on the sports book. But <laughs> uh, you know, I, I do take them to at least win outright. I'll go. I think yeah. Notre Dame absolutely. I think Notre Dame. Certainly has the chance to cover. Uh, I thought they were impressive against Georgia on a neutral field. You don't know what happens in that game. This is at Notre Dame Stadium. I like Virginia. I don't love Virginia. And I think Notre Dame wins this football game. I think they're going to win a lot of football games before the end of this year. Yeah, this is going to be another clean sweep. I'm going to go fighting Irish. Um, You know, they're coming off a very tough loss, but they played extremely well. If they run the table, they're going to have a good chance to get into the playoff, depending on what happens with conference championships. Um, obviously, they don't have that 13th data point, as they like to call it, since they're not in a conference. But um, I, I don't know a lot about Virginia. What I do know is they have a, a pretty good quarterback and a really good cornerback, or a safety hall, I think his name is. Um, so I think it's going to be very close, but I think Notre Dame's going to pull it out. Uh, Notre Dame tends to play like – uh, when they play pretty good teams at home, the games are generally very, very close, down to the wire. And I expect this game to come down to the wire as well. But I think Notre Dame will ultimately pull it out. Some, to you, to you, oh. I was just going to say something interesting. I found uh, Virginia, you know, I think they played Old Dominion last mm-hmm. week. And had, <laughs> they let Old Dominion put up a 17 spot on them uh, before, you know, rattling off, I think, a 28. Uh, they won 28-17. Um, and, you know, if they do that against Notre Dame, forget it. You know, you can't you – can't, give a team that as good as Notre Dame that kind of lead and especially, especially on the road come back. Yeah, yeah no to my point was going to be to your playoff implications for Notre Dame yes of course they'd have to win out best case scenario for them clearly is Alabama beats LSU or vice versa and then one of those teams loses to Georgia in the SEC title game and in theory Georgia to somewhat take care of business so now you're putting everybody on par Georgia right, is in right. and Notre Dame is hey Put us up against that second best SEC team. We think we're right there. So that's how that would be their pathway. It would be difficult for it, them it, to get there, it, yeah, but it's right. possible. Yep, um, definitely. Um, next game, um, I I had trouble picking this week's games, and this one I picked Georgia Tech at Temple because Jeff Collins, the old Temple coach, takes over for the rambling wreck that they are right now of Georgia <laughs> Tech. Um, not off to a hot start. Uh, Losses Citadel. Um, Temple, though, looked good in their first couple games, got walloped by Buffalo um, this past weekend. So an interesting game, a homecoming in a sense, if you want to call it that, for Jeff Collins. You have to think that Temple's going to be fired up to play him, uh, prove a message. So that's that's who we're going with. The local local Owls are hosting the Yellow Jackets. Uh, and at home. Uh, the important factor here is they're hosting them. So the Temple at home is a, is a tough cookie. Uh, found that you know in their last seven home games or five home games six home games pardon me they're five and one against the spread uh, and they're a big favorite going into this one and I think they carry that out so I got Temple taking it at home look at this look at us together <laughs> is better because I like Temple as well in this one no doubt about it rambling wreck of Georgia Tech you put it well they are an absolute mess uh, they're a mess right now. They have not looked good at any point this season. I don't anticipate that continues. Uh, Russo, local kid, playing quarterback for Temple. I like them to win that game against Georgia Tech. Yeah, I like them too. And and I'm just picking this because I get to pick last and I need to make up points. So, I mean, I might not make up too many points, but I'm just going to get above 500 soon if I keep following you guys in your pick. So, I'm going Temple here. Um, They are the better team. Georgia Tech, even though they're – well. You're in the ACC. I guess that's not really saying much right now for football, but um, they just haven't looked good. And, and mm-hmm. it's going to take Jeff Collins a while to turn that program around if he's able to. Uh, so I'm going Temple there. I think the next two games, um, and even maybe the Penn State spread, is where we're going to we're going to start to differ a little bit. Um, and, and these games are uh, packed in the Big Twelve. We have Iowa State um, traveling to undefeated Baylor. Yeah. Uh, 
difficult one to pick. Uh, coin, very, very difficult. Flip, yeah. Essentially, from from what I see, um, you know, I think ESPN had it like a fifty one percent, you know, chance that Iowa State wins this one, and and they're a team that rarely gets um, favored on the road, you know, in 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 their conference. So. Uh, something interesting to find out, and they are favored against Baylor. They won their last two against Baylor. I think it's like what two and a half they're favored by. Uh, yeah, it was started at small. three and a half. It moved down to two and right. a half, which has that's what has me a little <laughs> concerned about this one. So I know you know Iowa State, um, solid team, but you know I I think in this one I'm I'm gonna go with Baylor and uh, Matt Rule, Matt Rule, the uh, the former Temple guy, uh, to to pull out the uh, I guess the slight upset in this one. Okay, yeah, all we need is. To pick a Miami game and Manny Diaz, and we'll have all, all the, the t- formal. <laughs> well, formal uh, Boston t- College, Adazio. <laughs> yeah. uh, I don't know where Al Golden is these days, but it, <laughs> we could do a whole segment on former Temple <laughs> coaches within the last ten years. <laughs> I like Iowa State in this one. A tough, tough loss to Iowa. Uh, I think you look at Baylor's schedule, and of course, much like the stock market. All of this is already factored into <laughs> Rob's uh, lines that he's picking, et cetera, and to the ESPN predictors that he's referencing. But I like Iowa State. I think they've challenged themselves more. I think they're going to come out of that last game um, you know, with a little bit of fire. And as much as that rivalry game is going to hurt, I think that's a team that's sneaky in the Big 12 that's going to win a lot of games in conference. Uh, I don't see them necessarily winning the conference, but could they be a back end for that third? Maybe even second if they can steal one of Texas? You know, perhaps. But I like them to win this game against Baylor. I think Baylor starts to fall off a little bit. Yeah, I'm going to agree with Bob on this one. I think that Iowa State has been tested um, earlier in the season more. I mean, they escaped, I think, a triple OT against Northern Iowa, which really shouldn't happen, but it did. They were tested there. Um, they were tested against Iowa at home and, and two rain delays, I think, tallying like totaling, I think it was like a five, five hour delay or maybe like a six hour long game, something crazy like that. Um, they, I think they've been tested in those two games. And I think that um, because of that, and I don't think Baylor's really been tested this year too much. I think Iowa State is going to win on the road. And I, and I agree. I think that it, in the Big 12, you're looking at Oklahoma, Texas, that third spot's kind of up for grabs. Iowa State, maybe a Kansas State, uh, maybe a Baylor. But um, besides that, it's it's totally up for grabs, that third spot. Um, so I'm, I'm going to go Iowa State there. And then our um, our fifth head-to-head game, we are going to go to the SEC. And we are going to go Kentucky at South Carolina. Interesting rivalry. Uh, did some digging on the, the history of this one. For, do you know, you guys, I'm sure you guys probably know. I'm speaking to the choir here. Um 2000 to 2009, South Carolina went 10 and 0 against these Wildcats. Wow, I did sounds not like, know. Sounds like they Florida. <laughs> uh, and then, but however, the last few years, uh, it's been all Kentucky, uh, and not even close in, in these games. Uh, looking at how they've gone, so uh, for whatever reason, the the 2010s decade seems to be Kentucky's uh, over South Carolina, and, and um, I just it, it's one of those things where it, it's an SEC rivalry that. Um, you know, it ebbs and it flows, and right now it's flowing in Kentucky's favor, and so I'm going to go with Kentucky. Stoops! <laughs> Love him. He's doing a great job with that program, the head coach of Kentucky, and uh, man, I think they are going to carry on. A couple tough losses early. Could not follow up their Should have beat Florida. Yeah, couldn't follow up the historic win last year, though, against Florida with another one, but man, they have hung tough in some tough early games. South Carolina has been kind of brutal this year, uh, and I think Kentucky wins this one. With everything you guys just said, <laughs> I'm going to go South Carolina. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I think the freshman quarterback they have, uh, Holinsky, um, if you guys, if the viewers out there, you guys might not even know this, but his brother was the uh, quarterback yep. of Washington State that yep. ended his ended his life um, a couple years ago. And this kid is a freshman, true freshman. He's a really good young quarterback. Um, I think this game's at since it's at home for South Carolina, they they really shouldn't win this game, but they're favored by three points, and that's probably the home field. So I think it's going to be down to the wire type of game. I think that they pull it off at night at home. Um, they need. They're desperate for a win. Um, they lost their first two conference games, Alabama, and Missouri. Not even close where those games. Um, <laughs> and looking at their schedule, it doesn't get much easier. Going to Georgia, go then playing Florida. 
I, they need they need this win desperately, and I think uh, desperate times call for desperate measures. I think the Gamecocks pulled out. There you go. Okay. Got some differences there at the end. Yeah, That's I got to shake right. it up a little bit. <laughs> um, and then finally, uh, we, we turn to the um, the spread. Penn State. I don't know what you have, Rob. I have them at six and a half. Is that kind of what yeah, you had? That's so right. that's Penn right. State comes in at six and a half point favorites. Um, kind of what I thought they would have been if Maryland took care of business at Temple, but they didn't. I, I thought the line would have been a little higher, maybe nine and a half, ten and a half. Regardless, Vegas knows they come in at six and a half favorites. Do you think Penn State covers and um, ultimately uh, gives a score prediction too? Yeah. Um, so if this was 2017, 2018, I think they easily cover. Uh, but I, I think with, with the, the last two years, it's like 104 to six right. in favor of Penn State. Yep. Um, you know, clearly different teams this year. Uh, no Trace McSorley, no Saquon Barkley, uh, no My- Sanders in right. the backfield. Miles so this Sanders. is right. a very different Penn State team. Um, I think that that line is is accurate. Um, Given everything, you know, Penn State struggling against Pitt. They've had a couple, you know, Bob breaking it down on the blitz here, you know, showing what the struggles are at the quarterback situation there. So I think, though, um, you know, given Penn State maybe a little more tested to start the season, Ohio or Maryland, rather, uh, you know, I, I'm wearing the Syracuse shirt, <laughs> but I heard you guys talking, not, not what everyone expected them to be this year. And to see them lose the way they did the temple, um, they're, they're kind of in a, a tough spot right now. So both teams kind of to, you know, sputtering out of the gate here. Um, I, I think Penn state covers, I do think they cover. Um, so that six and a half point spread means I got to go at least, at least seven. seven. <laughs> um, so I'm going to say we'll go with, uh, 27, 20 Penn state barely. Cover. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Wow. I will say this, and Rob kind of stole the thunder, but I agree with him wholeheartedly. I would not touch this game with a (laughs) 10-foot pole if it was my money on the line. But since I am forced on this show. (laughs) And no money on the line. (laughs) Yeah, I don't know what I would have done if it was was seven, really. I mean, seven feels like the number. Can I call a push? No. Uh, I think Penn State covers six and a half, though, and I do think it's something – to the tune of 24 to 14, uh, difficult game on the road. Really, in many ways, reminds me of Gary Nova that's, and the Rutgers. That's what I've heard. Other, I think, I think that's what James Franklin said. This kind of reminds really? him of is a, four or five years ago when Penn State went to Piscataway to play Rutgers early on in the season, and yep. they got out of there with a 13-10 win. Yep. Billy, ugly, Del- ugly, ugly, but they won. Um, you know, Rutgers is hyped up for the game, you know, night game at their place. It does have a very similar feel to that. Yeah, but I do like Penn State, 24-14, to 14, cover, win by 10 or so, dogfight. Yeah, it's going to be um, – there's a lot of unknowns going into this game, which I think is why the line sits at what it is. I think if this game's at Penn State, I think Penn State's easily, easily two, two touchdowns favorites, at least yep. probably. First road game for – New quarterback, Sean Clifford. It's a night game. It's against a Big Ten East opponent, um, one that's going to be playing their A game and have a lot to prove. Uh, national television. I mean, all these things. And, and going off of Penn State's last game against Pitt, um, I see why it is at six and a half. Uh, really, now I do. Um, I think they do cover. Um, I think they're I think they going to get off to another slow start, which I don't think is good, um, obviously because I think they're going to be playing a little bit tighter than they should be. If they can get off to a quick start, great. Uh, but a slow start should keep it a closer game. I think they're going to win by about 10. I'm going in that 31-21 range. I, like uh, I think they get a late late touchdown or a late field goal to really really put the game away. Good stuff. Rob, All right. I appreciate the, Six and oh. the time. 6-0. and oh. <laughs> Very possible this week. Rub the helmet for good luck. <laughs> there you go. We'll see how he does. But we appreciate you coming on, telling us yeah. your story, and uh, hyping up some interest for LaSalle I, versus St. Joe's Prep this let's, Saturday. Let's go. I mean, anything can happen. So it's these are. Let's not forget these are 16, 17, 8 year old kids, eighteen year old kids. So uh, yeah, I know the names on the back of the jersey say one thing, names on the front say something completely different, but. Uh, anything can happen in high school football. Mm-hmm. So It should be fun. It's one of our most anticipated broadcasts that we've ever done, given where both teams are in the state and should be a lot of fun. If it is sold out, certainly you can watch it on Bob Long Sports. We highly recommend it and encourage it. And for the folks that are in the stadium, you turn it on, you can see the replay of the game.
something you can't see when you're there out you there. Go. So a lot of ways to Very view, a cool. lot of ways to stay in touch with LaSalle football. Rob Stott, my honorable color commentator, along with Tyler Kern, who are at odds this week. Tyler sitting in the clubhouse <laughs> as Rob strolls down the 18th fairway. Here we go. Should be fun. <laughs> Tyler, appreciate the time as always, my friend. It was a good show. Real good show. Real good show. <laughs> I, it was. It was. I, I need. I need to get some wins this week. That's. That's really what I'm thinking about as my teams because six and twelve and and that's that's not good, especially when you're giving people advice. Yeah, it's a it's a sole focus of Tyler Gallagher <laughs> as he heads into the week. I'm already in the zone. In the zone. Enjoy the football, everybody. Thanks for being with us here on the Nittany Lions Sports Report. We will be back next Tuesday at 7:30 p.m. as we always are to break down the Maryland game. And preview the upcoming matchup. That'll be a fun one to talk about. Yeah. Purdue at Homecoming, home yep. before a big five-game slog starting with Iowa mm. on the road. Should be fun. You'll see Rob on Saturday night, Tyler next Tuesday, and I'm Bob Long saying so long here from Blue Belt. We will be back very soon here on Bob Long Sports. Take care and good night. <laughs>